today with Bradford and Brooks. We have uh, Miss Amy McGrath as a very special uh, guest here at WBRT. Good morning, Amy. Good morning. It's great to be here. Good morning. And Amy is a, uh, the, a Democrat seeking the Democratic nomination uh, for U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's, you're one of ten mm -hmm. candidates. Yeah. However, I think uh, uh, if you uh, follow politics at all, uh, you obviously are the front runner because uh, uh, Mitch McConnell and his supporters have been uh, throwing slings and arrows at you. Well, that since is what the they day do. You announced. That is what they do. <laughs> and full page advertisements. Yeah. That is what they do. I'm right. afraid. Yeah. Right. So obviously you're the you're the front runner, and you uh, you narrowly lost mm -hmm. the sixth congressional mm -hmm. uh, election to mm -hmm. Andy Barr. So mm -hmm. obviously your your thoughts and ideas and your just being a uh, have resonated with with voters. Mm -hmm. And so now is the opportunity to uh, uh, tackle a, uh, the uh, the man who uh, who has such has high negatives, but also gets reelected. So, yeah, and I mean, I think that my core message from the very beginning, whether last cycle or this cycle, is um, we need leaders who put this country in Kentucky above their political party. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what resonated um, last cycle. Mm -hmm. um, now I was a, you know, I, I, whenever you're new into something, uh, especially politics here in Kentucky, you don't always win your first time. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of name recognition. There's a sure. lot of things that people need to, right. you know. And and so to me, we 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 had a lot of momentum coming out of that race. I mean, I've had people come up to me and say they registered to vote for the first time to vote for me. Mm -hmm. They're 55 years old. Hmm. That's that's the most humbling thing you can you can get from somebody and that's awesome and and it's because people are tired of a dysfunctional system and a lot of people want you know uh, new leaders leaders particularly who have not grown up within a political party right. mm -hmm. who they can trust to do what is right for Kentucky uh, regardless of whether whether their party says one thing or another and that's kind of the opposite of Mitch McConnell. Amy, I, one of the first questions we always ask a, a candidate is uh, what impelled you to run sure. for office at this time? What were the what were the motivating factors? Yeah, well, I spent 24 years in the military, uh, 20 years as a Marine Corps officer. Uh, my husband spent 20 years as a Navy officer, and so our adult lives have been dedicated to public service to this country, um, putting this country above you know um, ourselves and our families, and and certainly our political parties and we felt like uh, we need better leaders in this country and if we could do if we could come back to Kentucky because for me this is my home mm -hmm. and make a difference and be the leader that I always wanted to vote for myself that's why I mean that's at the end of the day I both my husband and I looked at each other and said you know we got good leaders in the military mm -hmm. but boy our political leaders stink for lack of a better word <laughs> and we need we're in peril we we have a dysfunctional system that's not working people are disconnected with their government they don't believe that it can it can work anymore um, they don't believe that that leaders are are honest they have integrity they're very concerned about corruption and you know what I am too and so for me the only way to change it is to to run myself and be that leader that that I know um, we need and and then also at, at the same time advocate for things, structural change like term limits. I understand that uh, you really have been non-political up to now, mm -hmm. and that your husband is a Republican. That's right. My husband is a lifelong Republican, and uh, I am a Democrat. Although I was an independent for most of my adult life, mm -hmm. when I was a military officer, I was an independent for most of that time, and it really was because I saw the goods in, in both political parties and. I didn't consider myself um, ideologically driven. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to do what was right for this country, um, and that's the attitude that I bring to this uh, to this campaign. Now, Amy, you uh, your first kind of experience with politics goes back to your to your childhood, mm -hmm. when you were writing letters, <clears throat> questioning uh, yeah. members of Congress about the uh, the policy regarding uh, women aviators, right? Because you had your sights set. Right, as a young young lady, mm -hmm. uh, becoming an aviator, I did, and uh, and your your response um, 
uh, initially from, I guess, Kentucky legislators was zip. That's right. Nothing. Yeah, I had a, a congressman who wrote me back who basically <laughs> said, um, I don't want to change the law. Women can do this in the military but can't do this. And I'm not, I don't believe that you should get the opportunity to be a fighter pilot. I mean, that, I mean, you read between the lines, that's essentially what he said. Mm -hmm. um, and his name uh, was Congressman Jim Bunning. Mm -hmm. uh, he later became a senator. Uh, at the time, I was, you know, 13 years old or so, I wrote Mitch McConnell. And, of course, um, Senator McConnell never wrote me back. Um, but I didn't quit. I wrote every member of the House and Senate Armed Services Committees. That's about 80 different individuals from around the country, asking them to change that law. And all I ever wanted, I never wanted to be placed in the cockpit of an F-18 because I was a woman. Right. I only wanted the opportunity to compete. And if I was good enough, mm -hmm. I wanted the opportunity to fly in that jet. And um, that was my first understanding of politics. Because, you know, like it or not, one side said no change, not going to work for any change. And the other side said you ought to be able to be given an opportunity. And our military exists to fight and win the nation's wars, and we should have the best people in those positions. And you ought to be able to compete, and if you're good enough, mm -hmm. you ought to be able to give it, be given a shot. So that, that was my first understanding at the age of 13, 14. Well, you not only became a, a combat fighter pilot, but also you understand you became a national security advisor. Can you tell us about what sure. does that mean? What, yeah. what so, did you have to do? So what? after my flying tours, and I did three combat tours, um, Afghanistan and Iraq, and flew for over a decade, um, I went into a different part of my career where um, I became a what was called a congressional fellow, and I was an advisor to the House Armed Service, a uh, senior ranking member of the House Armed Services Committees. Uh, for one year. Um, and that, in that capacity, I advised in defense and foreign policy matters. Mm -hmm. And I, it was a very interesting year because I had just come from Afghanistan. My mm -hmm. second tour in Afghanistan was in 2010. And then I went to, the, to, to Capitol Hill in 2011. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a contrast from going from literally from combat right to Capitol Hill. And boy, I could tell you some stories on, on that one. And then I did, from there, I went to the Pentagon and uh, worked two years in the Pentagon as the Marine Corps liaison to all other government, uh, federal government agencies to include the CIA, um, FBI, and mostly Department of State. So you have a broad background in, in international affairs. I do, and I, I, at that time I also went back and got my master's degree in international affairs um, from Johns Hopkins. I mean, it was really been my whole life defending the country, mm -hmm. um, but understanding how our country interacts um, in the globalized world and the conflicts that we're in and how to make sure that we're, you know, not in frivolous wars because mm -hmm. I've lost mm -hmm. friends in these battles wow. and um, we need people that understand um, international affairs, international cultures, but also understand our politics back home and, and have the courage to, to stand up and, and say, hey, we don't need to be there. You know, if right. we're in these, some of these places. Well, and yeah, this, this kind of leads me to my next question. What are your thoughts on our continued involvement in, in Afghanistan? Uh, is that warranted? Uh, you know, uh, I think most, a lot of Americans are war weary. You yeah. Know, and uh, would like to see us uh, not have combat troops yeah. in harm's way. But is that, is that practical? I mean, speaking as a veteran, and, yeah. and I mean, you, you've been there. I have. It's a, it's a different world over mm -hmm. there, and I always tell people that there's, it, it's just not a black and white world. Right. There are survivors in Afghanistan. The people there will be for you if it can save their life and their family's lives. They will be against you if it can save their life and their family's mm -hmm. lives, and we have, to, we have to understand that. I, I'm worried because we don't have an, uh, enough veterans in Congress. We, we have mm -hmm. the lowest percentage of veterans in Congress yeah. in recent history. Mm -hmm. And we, we certainly don't have enough who have fought in the, in the post-9-11 uh, military uh, modern conflicts that we have that just aren't black and white. The Afghanistan is a very complex area. Mm -hmm. I'm, I do not want Afghanistan to fall into a failed state in which um, al-Qaeda and other uh, international actors can attack us again. Mm -hmm. 
So how do we do that without having a presence there for you know decades where we're we're basically involved in a civil war? Right. Um, and I think that's the, that's the rub. I am I'm hopeful. I know that President Trump, uh, his administration, has talked about trying to get um, the Taliban to the table with the um, uh, with the Afghan government mm -hmm. right now. I'm really hopeful that that happens. Uh, I think you're going to have to have some kind of, of negotiated peace. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm, I'm hoping right now. Uh, I'm not a fan of, of America occupying Afghanistan. We're just not going to turn it into a Jeffersonian democracy. Right. So I think we have to be realistic about what we can achieve there. But um, ultimately, there does need to be a negotiated peace. So. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead, Margie. Uh, well, I, I was so interested in what you said, <laughs> I lost my uh, train of thought. Uh, tell us about your family. I mean, sure. I know you've already mentioned your husband. Yeah. But I know you have some children. I do. I have, um, Eric and I um, have three small children, um, seven, five, and three, and two boys and a girl, and they are amazing. Uh, people always want to tell me, well, what, or ask me, what is what is harder, being a fighter pilot or running for office, pu public office? And I say, you know, I'm a mom of three small kids, <laughs> uh -huh. and so that's the hardest thing I think I've ever done in my life. Mm -hmm. um, they're wonderful, and um, and you know, they they keep me on my toes. It's certainly uh, one of those life changing events is when you introduce children. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and and they don't listen to me like Marines used to listen to me. So no. I mean, <laughs> they don't say yes. Yeah. I'm dealing with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, well, uh, in facing you faced a lot of dangers and you faced a lot of obstacles, but I would assume that one of the biggest obstacles you're facing here is uh, an incumbent U.S. senator who has amassed a war chest of. Eleven and a half million before he, he even started raising money for the campaign. So, I know. tell us what that's like. One of the things you're having well, to go you know, and this is that. how Mitch McConnell remains in power. Um, Mitch McConnell, since you brought up money, gets ninety-five percent of his um, campaign funds from outside Kentucky by special interest groups, mostly. Right. Uh, he and that that is reflected in his um, decisions and in his policies and in his you know um, holding up things like uh, basic um, measures to try to bring down prescription drug prices. I mean he's bought off by big pharma. He gets the most money from big pharma than any member of Congress, hmm. at least in the last cycle. And so you know he votes with who gives him the money. And and you're you're absolutely right. Uh, he's he has had many years to build it up. But you know what? Uh, we have people from uh, Kentucky and around the country who uh, believe that he's got to go. That he's not right for the country. He's um, not been good for Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And look, we have some. We have the highest cancer rates in the country. We have some of the highest rate of diabetes. We have an opioid and a drug problem. Uh, we have some of the highest uh, rates or, or per capita spending on prescription mm -hmm. medication. Right. We have a senator who not only doesn't want to fix any of these problems, it, I mean, doesn't, has actually voted to, to throw people off their health care. Right. Now, you know, if you're talking about the, the Affordable Care Act, look, it was not a perfect piece of legislation. Right. No major piece of legislation ever passed our, go our Congress mm -hmm. perfect. But we're Americans, man. We fix it. We don't we don't uh, we don't throw it away for purely political reasons without a plan. Throwing you would have thrown a quarter of a million Kentuckians off their health care without a plan, and that's why patriots like John McCain give it gave it you know McConnell's bill the big fat thumbs down, mm -hmm. and that's why you know even President Trump <clears throat> called it mean, yeah. and, and I just feel like you know we we need people who are going to look at these things as these are problems that need solutions, and we need problem solvers, and not people that look at everything through the political lens and mm -hmm. how to get a political win. Because when you do that, you're just hurting Kentucky. Yeah. I, I also read you had uh, a, a lot of individual donations. Uh, the last mm -hmm. figure I read was 229,000 donations from yeah. individuals. 
and that the average donor gave $36. That's right. I mean, and that's, I'm really proud of that, you know, and when people say to me, well, you, you're, you're getting money from outside Kentucky. Well, you know what? That veteran in Iowa who's handing me 20, in my campaign 25 bucks, guess what? He's not handing me draft legislation at the same time. Hmm. He just wants better government. Mm -hmm. He just wants the dysfunction to stop, the corruption to stop. Um, and that's, you know, that's why. And we're going to be able to compete against Mitch McConnell in a way he's never seen. Well, Amy, my, next, my question is, uh, where would you position yourself on the political spectrum? I know that uh, uh, I ran across a website uh, that it was attacking you back in your congressional campaign, and it uh, had you sandwiched between uh, Hillary Clinton and Nancy Pelosi. There was an image of your hmm. in between them. Um, where, where on the political spectrum uh, do, you, you know, do you position yourself? Because, I, because some of your views are, are more moderate than, than, sure. than, than some of other you know, presidential candidates. Absolutely. Um, I think that, first of all, the ideological spectrum is so disjointed now. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at, look at President Trump. Look, look at the, the, the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. I mean, tariffs are not conservative. Mm -hmm. Running a massive federal deficit in the, in the tr trillion, year after year after year, is not conservative. So, you know, in my mind, uh, it, it just depends on the issue. Right. I, I, you know, I think in terms of national security, for example, I believe we need to have a strong military um, and in a budget that reflects the fact that we've been at war for all these years. You know, and I, I, I think that... What you tell me what that where that is on the ideological mm -hmm. spectrum, right. you know, with regards to um, uh, health care, I I just personally believe that we as Americans we are a rich you know a, a country that is one of the richest in the world. We should be able to work towards allowing all Americans to have health care somehow. Mm -hmm. Now there's lots of ways to get there. Right. Yeah, you know, but. I mean, the fact that we have the number one cause of bankruptcy in America mm -hmm. is health care bills. Is. The fact that we have people who have to, that they can't get promotions, they can't take a promotion because they, they, will, they will, you know, lose their health care for some reason. Uh, they can't retire or become entrepreneurs because they're tied to right. their health care. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, you know, people who have children that are worried about they can't go to the emergency room because they don't know how to pay for it. I mean, this is, we got to work on this. And, and so where does that lead me? I don't think I'm radical because I think that people need to have health care. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, guess I, it's, I guess I'm not answering that question in a way because I just feel like it's, it's so, so many people want to put folks in, in a box. Right. right. You know what? That's not America. We, we don't need to be put in a box. We need to find solutions to these, whether it's immigration, whether it's health care, whether it's good quality jobs, whether it's um, infrastructure, which is a big thing for Kentucky, mm -hmm. and it's something Mitch McConnell has said he doesn't want to do, and it's hurting us. Um, you know, all of these things, I just think I'm, I'm somebody who, who wants to get things done. I know on your, uh, that you've mentioned, talked about Eastern Kentucky and the loss of coal jobs. And, and the economy in Eastern Kentucky has always been a, been a problem. How do we, what, how do we... Uh, how, do we how do we work on it and revitalize? We revitalize Eastern Kentucky. Yeah, so I would agree <clears throat> with you. Um, I also, though, feel that um, that region has been in decline because of the, the decline of the industry, and mm -hmm. it's happened over the last 20 years. And right. by the way, mm -hmm. Senator McConnell has known. Mm -hmm. The industry has known what was happening. Right. The fact that they have not been honest with people for 20 some years, blaming it somehow on, on a political party or some, you know, the reason of the decline is automation, mm -hmm. it's fracking in which the Republicans pushed mm -hmm. <laughs> natural gas, which is cheaper, and renewable energy, <clears throat> which is cheaper. Sure. And by the way, um, renewable energy, I mean, if you want to talk about the wave of the future, the mil our United States military is one of the, the biggest proponents of renewable energy. Why? Because it saves lives on the battlefield. All right? Mm -hmm. So this is where we're going. 
And this is where we need 21st century leaders who are a new generation and not leaders like Mitch McConnell who, who are an old gener older generation that think of everything through a political lens. Mm -hmm. We have got to, to look forward. How do you revitalize? Well, there's three things that we really have to do. And we have to do them long term and it needed to start 20 years ago. Okay? Instead of playing political games, we needed to have done this 20 years ago and we need to do it right now. One is investment in um, education, real investments in education and vocational training and workforce. Two, we have got to have infrastructure. And now I'm not just talking about roads, dams, bridges, 20th century infrastructure. I'm talking about 21st century infrastructure for the modern world. What does that mean? Folks, it means broadband. Mm -hmm. It means cell phone coverage everywhere. I've talked to business leaders that want to relocate in, in eastern Kentucky or certain places in Kentucky. Guess what? They fly into Bluegrass Airport. They drive 25 minutes east, and what happens? They lose cell phone coverage. Mm -hmm. They turn their, their rental car right around. They run right back to the Bluegrass Airport and fly to one of the nine other places in the country that has modern infrastructure. Mm -hmm. No business is going to want to come to a county in Kentucky that cannot talk to the modern world. It's a fact. And in my mind, and this may be the difference between myself and, and Mitch McConnell, is I believe that is a public good. The mm -hmm. same way Republican President Eisenhower thought about Rose interstate highway system in the 1950s, is that's what we need to think about in terms of, of broadband of the future. The third thing is health care. Look, no business is going to want to come if, if, if businesses are not going to want to be, be here if we do not have a, a healthy workforce. And I'm talking about the opioid mm -hmm. crisis, the drug problem that we have here. The Chamber of Commerce of Kentucky will tell you, and that's not exactly a left-leaning organization, yeah. will tell you that the drug problem is one of the single biggest impediments to growth in, in Kentucky. If we do not tackle it, and Mitch McConnell does, has done virtually nothing on this, um, nowhere near what is needed to tackle this issue. We've got to tackle those three things, Jim, or, or we're not going anywhere. All righty. Well, I think uh, our time with you is about up. You've got other places to All go right. today. I'm sorry. I could talk all day. <clears throat> oh, well, I've, I've enjoyed our conversation, and it's been very refreshing. Yeah. All right. Uh, Amy McGrath, candidate for uh, Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate in the primary. And awesome. uh, to me, I just think it's it's interesting how Mitch McConnell is going after you slings and arrows in the primary, mm -hmm. you know, but obviously he considers you the biggest a, a threat to, uh, so, and that's, that's kind of his uh, mode of operation is to attack, attack, attack. Well, that's how he always <clears throat> wins. He's mm -hmm. the king of negative campaigning. Um, he's the king of dark money, mm -hmm. uh, which is crushing our country, frankly. Um, it's something that I want to tackle. Uh, and, and take on. I mean, dark money is the, this idea that there's unlimited funds that can be put into campaigns and we don't know where they come from, Jim. We don't know if it comes from Russia or China or anywhere else and I just think it's wrong. We, we should know as Americans who is funding this uh, messaging and, you know, it's, it's really going to hurt us if we don't. All right, Amy, uh, thank you for coming today. All right. We've, pre we've enjoyed our conversation. Yeah. And we will. Uh, Good luck. <clears throat> thank you very much. We'll follow you on the campaign trail. I appreciate and, that. And uh, perhaps uh, in the fall, uh, you, you might make a swing by Bardstown again. We'll be. I'd love looking to. Forward to talking to you again. I'd love to. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great day. Thank you. Amy.